part of the reason I'm doing this is to encourage medical students to consider this specialty because nationally and internationally, there are not enough pathologists and there are not enough forensic pathologists. Dr. Judy Melanick, forensic pathologist in the house. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am great. I, um, I'm excited to chat with you tonight. Every time I get to hear you talk, uh, it's just awesome because your job is really cool and, and students love to hear the, the nitty gritty of forensic pathology, something that not a lot of students go into healthcare thinking, I want to be a forensic pathologist. So that's probably changed a little bit with TV shows and your book working stiff and, and other, other kind of media out there that, that, uh, glamorize mm -hmm. forensic pathology, but we need more, we need more forensic pathologists. So hello. Thank you for joining. Hello. Me. <laughs> great. It's great to be wonderful here. <laughs> Island of New Zealand. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'm in New Zealand right now. I'm, do I'm doing, I'm actually in the Wellington uh, mortuary. I just finished a postmortem exam of an autopsy. So I'm taking a little break now during my lunch hour to talk to you. Yes, it is lunch hour here. <laughs> very, very <laughs> so it's 12 exciting. here because the time difference. Awesome. All right. Before we jump into slides, you have a, an amazing slideshow to, to take a look at tonight. I want to know what is the biggest myth or misconception that students, whether pre-med or medical students or even residents have about forensic pathology? Well, I think that the biggest misconception is that it's morbid and depressing when really, it, to me, it's just the opposite. It's life affirming. Uh, in fact, any of the specialties of medicine that focus on death or dying are actually as difficult as that sounds and may seem. For the people who work in those fields, we have, you know, the reminder every single day that life is short and that it's precious. And so you end up with this real appreciation of your family, of your uh, surroundings, of your privilege, of the fact that you can wake up every morning and I'm alive today and I have my kids here and this is my husband and this is my life. And, and so you have that constant reminder of death, that uh, memento mori, as they say, um, that makes those professions, whether it's hospice care or mortuary work or uh, forensic pathology, like what I do, really, really precious and actually really very a, po a very positive experience for the people involved in them. Yeah. What led you to this world? Wow. Uh, what led me to this world was I decided I didn't want to be a surgeon. Anymore. <laughs> so I had finished medical school, really excited about surgery, wanting to do general surgery. I lasted for about six months in a surgery residency training before I just burned out because it was every other night on call. It was really kind of an abusive environment in terms of the training program. And I had done some pathology when I was a medical student. And I really liked those rotations. I didn't find it as exciting as surgery. Uh, surgery is very hands-on. Um, but uh, And I liked the patient contact, but just couldn't work those hours. And so when I quit surgery, I called back the pathology department and said, hey, would you like a failed surgeon? <laughs> and they had no, they knew me for my time as a medical student. Uh, I did what's called a post-sophomore fellowship in pathology, which is a year that you can dedicate in the middle of medical school to doing pathology. And it actually counts towards your residency. So I switched back. They were more than happy to take me back. <laughs> and I switched back to pathology and didn't look back. I love pathology. It's so much fun. The hours are reasonable. As I write in Working Stiff with my uh, co-author husband, TJ, they'll still be dead tomorrow. So there's no <laughs> emergency autopsies. And with regards to the lifestyle and the um, excitement, it's still there. So I, I love being hands-on. I have a lot of patient contact and patient care um, in my profession, which I don't think of the deceased individuals as my patients. I think mm -hmm. of their families as my patients. So they're the ones I'm interacting with. They're the ones I develop doctor patient relationships with. And yet it's incredibly satisfying and really every single day is, is fun. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow. I'll let you uh, talk all about it and we'll have some sure. fun here. Okay. All right. Ah, here we go. Right. So that's me. 
Okay, so I wanted to um, educate, so that's just me. I, I work both for uh, the Wellington uh, uh, New Zealand Mortuary, but I'm also a forensic pathologist. I have my own business, uh, that's Pathology Expert Inc. So I do medical legal consulting for attorneys. So in addition to doing autopsies for uh, the Ministry of Justice here in New Zealand, and prior to that, I was in uh, California working for Sheriff Corner System. Um, but I also do uh, consulting for attorneys whenever there's a wrongful death. And we'll cover a little bit of that as we speak. So if you go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to cover the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner. Uh, a lot of people use these terms interchangeably. They're not exactly the same thing. So coroners are citizens. In many cases, they have no specified training. They're often administrators or law enforcement officers, and they're either elected or appointed. And they do death investigations, but they will hire pathologists like me to perform the autopsies. And the medical examiner is actually a physician. So the, it's, they have the same title or role as the coroner. They determine the cause and the manner of death, but the entire office is run by doctors. They're usually forensic board certified, which is what the uh, standard requirements are to practice forensic pathology. And they may be affiliated with the public health department. And because of all the training that's required to be a medical examiner, doctor who's also a coroner, um, they're usually appointed as opposed to elected. So if you go to the next slide, you could see a, a map of the United States that shows you the systems that we have in the U.S. Uh, some are uh, coroner systems and some are medical examiner systems and some are a mixture of both. And you can see based on this map that it's really the, the state laws define what kind of system you have. And then those state laws are administered on a county by county basis. So I have worked in New York City in the past when I when I was working in my fellowship. And that's a medical examiner system. It was run by doctors. And then I also worked in San Francisco, which was a medical examiner system. And then subsequently, I worked at Alameda County in Oakland in the Bay Area. San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, Alameda County is a sheriff coroner system. So the whole system was run by law enforcement. I was still doing autopsies, but my uh, position or title was different. Uh, in one of the key differences between medical examiner and coroner systems is in a medical examiner system, the doctors decide both the cause and the manner of death. And in a sheriff coroner system, the doctors generally decide on the cause of death, but the sheriff coroner or the administrative coroner decides on the manner of death. And the manner of death has to do with classifying it, saying whether it's a natural death, an accident, a homicide, or a suicide. And we'll talk about that as we go forward and I'll also answer questions at the end. So next slide. Um, so to be me, to be a board certified forensic pathologist, um, that means you're certified by the American Board of Pathology. That's the body, the governing body that administers the exam. And you have to go to the medical school in the United States. As you know, medical school is four years. And <laughs> in general, usually you get your bachelor's degree for four years, and then you go to medical school for four years. Or there are some programs that are combined that are six years for your bachelor's and um, medical school combined. And then you have to do at the minimum three to four years of residency and one year of fellowship. And working stiff, the book that I co-authored with my husband, TJ, is about my fellowship. So if you're interested in what that fellowship training is like, that's a good book to, to read. Um, you have to sit for the anatomic pathology exam before you can take the forensic pathology exam. So there are two exams that you have to take in order to be a forensic pathologist. And they're about anywhere from 500 to 750, it depends on the year, board certified forensic pathologists that are currently practicing in the United States. That's an estimate, it changes. Um, in fact, we don't have enough of us. So I really like part of the reason I'm doing this is to encourage medical students to consider this specialty because nationally and internationally, there are not enough pathologists and there are not enough forensic pathologists. So you are guaranteed a job <laughs> when you finish your residency because then you're going to have multiple job offers and you're going to have to be able to decide between them because there are not enough pathologists in the world and there are not enough forensic pathologists, so much more so that New Zealand had to recruit me from the United States because there are not enough here. You so if you look at the kicking and yeah. screaming too. Oh, well, no, no, but we can talk about that as well. If we have questions about that, I, I came here because of COVID predominantly. Um, okay, so next slide. Um, so a medical examiner or a coroner will investigate any death that is violent, sudden, or unusual. 
any death where the person who died hasn't seen a doctor in the last 20 days before they died. So essentially, it's an unexpected death, because if you're going to be expected to be dying, you should have seen a doctor in about 20 days before you die, right? Um, any death that's related to accident or injury, whether it's old or recent, and any death that's a homicide, a suicide, or an accident. And any death where there's a suspicion of some sort of foul play or a criminal act played a role. So next slide. And the tools that we use to answer the questions about how did people die are, well, we first of all, we perform a postmortem exam. I'll take you through the autopsy in a minute. These are the tools that we use. You can see that when I open up the chest cavity, I'm actually using uh, tree loppers. <laughs> Those are uh, Fisker's tree loppers. And um, in that photo, I'm opening up the rib cage. Uh, I will use tools like a ladle in order to measure out blood. I will use a scalpel, um, scissors in order to dissect tissues. We will use a microscope and we'll also use tools like radiology, x-rays, in order to make diagnoses. Even post-mortem, we can x-ray bodies to figure out why they died. So we have to be uh, adept at being able to do radiology in addition to uh, microscopy, like working, you know, looking at slides under a microscope and the physical aspect of performing the autopsy itself, which is essentially a surgical exam, but it's done on the dead body. So next slide. So, so Blake, asks, yeah, so I'm question? trying to understand yeah. the question. Any autopsies on patients who come back? <laughs> I'm like, come back? How? I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, it, so it sounds like that might be a question about second autopsies, and maybe Blake can clarify while I talk about what an autopsy is. So we'll, yeah. we'll give Blake an opportunity to, to add to that. So in performing an autopsy, the first step I do is I look on the outside of the body. So I look at the external examination, um, and I describe everything that I see, and I write it down in uh, a I have a checklist where I write my findings down. And so I'll talk about, you know, what the color of the hair is, what the color of the eyes are. Are there any piercings? Are there any tattoos? Um, you know, what are the teeth? Are there any cavities? And I just work my way down head to toe describing everything I see. And that includes um, any scars or identifying marks or any injuries that I see on the outside of the body. And then we make a Y incision on the body and we take out the organs one by one. And you can see there's a scale there in the, in the picture. And we weigh those organs because we know what normal weights are and we can compare the organ weights that we're getting from the body to what the expected normal weights are <laughs> to see if they're normal or abnormal. And then we document, we slice up the organs and we look at them, the, the anatomy to figure out if there's any abnormalities that can explain the death. And we take specimens from the organs that we can send out for additional tests, like to look at under the microscope or to send to the lab to see if there's any chemicals or drugs, like for example, in the drug intoxication. And with each organ, we document what we see, disease or injury, and we document them in our diagrams, in our photographs, and in our autopsy report that we then write up. So that's a, that's a bigger part of my day. The first part of my day, usually the morning, is I'm in the mortuary, in the morgue, doing the autopsy. And usually in the afternoon, I'm typing up my reports, I'm talking to police or to family members over the phone, and I'm writing my reports, um, you know, finishing my reports, looking at photos, looking at lab results. So that, that's kind of a typical day. Start so to next finish, slide. how long does an yeah. autopsy take? Oh. Um, an autopsy can take, you know, the, the, the quick ones take about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, those are ones where people are do not have a lot of disease. And they may be uh, cases like hangings or overdoses where there's just like one finding, okay, or no findings, and we're just waiting for the toxicology. The complicated cases, the ones that are like uh, homicides, uh, multiple intersecting gunshot wounds, things like that, those can take multiple days where I put in several hours a day, usually in the morning. And then in the afternoon, like I said, I'm doing paperwork. I don't like do, I don't cut all day long. We'll uh, usually dedicate the morning to doing the, the autopsies. And we might go into the afternoon, but in most cases we can finish an autopsy unless it's really complex just in, in a few hours, three to four hours. Yeah. Um, so how do we determine the cause of death? So the majority of my cases are pretty easy. I find an obvious finding when I do the autopsy that explains to me why the person died. So for example, multiple gunshot wounds, it's a homicide. The cause of death isn't so much the issue. I'm doing the postmortem exam in order to collect evidence, <laughs> okay? So just because someone's shot, you know, there's no question about why they died, but I'm not doing the autopsy just to figure out why they died. I'm also doing the autopsy to collect evidence for the potential criminal case, okay? But the hard cases, there are hard cases, the, the smaller percentage, they are cases where I have a compelling story, but not enough trauma on the body to explain the death, or I have lots of trauma on the body, but the story doesn't add up. 
So anytime there's a disconnect between the story I'm being given and what I'm finding on the body, that means I have to do additional investigation, which that additional investigation might be a phone call to the family, or it might be looking at the medical records, or it might be looking at things under the microscope. It kind of depends on the individual case. Okay, next slide. So a good medical examiner reviews all the available data before coming to any kind of determination. And we try to meet with different groups associated with a case. When I say groups, I mean like the family members or the police, or in some cases it might be, you know, the girlfriend who found him been dead. You know, we might want to meet with her and talk to her to find out what she saw, especially when a case or a story doesn't make sense. Like I'm not getting the answers that match up with the physical findings, then I need to do a little bit more digging. And you try to keep an open mind and remain objective before you decide on the cause and the manner of that. So next slide. So how do we sort through the findings? Well, about 5% of our cases, it's not an overwhelming amount, 5% about, have overwhelming pathologic findings. So for example, gunshot wound of the head. That's not compatible with life. So that's going to be my cause of death, right? Or a burst aneurysm. Okay, I open up the chest and there's an aortic aneurysm and it burst and the chest is full of blood and the person bled out because of this burst aneurysm. So that would be an overwhelming pathologic finding. I could close up the body, got the cause of death. I don't even have to do a full autopsy in some of those cases, right? Um, those are rare though. Those are, like I said, only about 5%. The majority of my cases actually fall into class two, three, or four, which is class two is presence of disease with lethal potential. So I find let's say 80% narrowing of a coronary artery. You know, there are a lot of people who are walking around with that. It's a person can live with it, but it's not, it's not um, incompatible with life. <laughs> All right. So if I had 80% narrowing of a coronary artery and I don't have something overwhelming, like a gunshot wound to the head, that's going to be my cause of death. Okay. i found a pretty significant disease burden that can explain the death. And then class three and four are, classifications of deaths that show the limitation of an autopsy because an autopsy can't find everything. Um, for example, um, in class three, the example I like to give is a person comes into a bar and clutches their chest and they have chest pain, right? And they say, I can't breathe, I'm having chest pain and then they collapse. And I do the autopsy and I don't, I don't find 80% narrowing of a coronary artery. I find, let's say, 30% narrowing of a coronary artery. That's not that much. Most of us are walking around with that, okay? But I have a compelling story, okay? And I've ruled out other causes. There's no drugs. There's no other pathology. You know, there's no injuries. And so that's class three because I can't see vasospasm. Blood vessels, besides having cholesterol deposition, which is the narrowing of the vessel from cholesterol, they can spasm, just like a muscle spasm can occur. But a spasm only occurs when a person is alive. Okay, after death, all the muscles relax. I can't see that at autopsy, all right? So the 30% narrowing combined with some vasospasm that narrows it down to let's say 80 might be enough to cause that person's death. And the difference is, is the 30% narrowing is anatomy, but the spasm is physiology. It's how the body is functioning. And you can't see physiology after a person's dead. Physiology needs a living person. So that's where class three and class four fall into because there are certain diseases that have no anatomic findings. Another example would be a seizure disorder. Uh, people who have epilepsy during the midst of a seizure, they can have a sudden death. It's primarily either central neurologic or cardiac or a combination of both. They can have a sudden death due to epilepsy and I would do an autopsy and I'd find absolutely nothing. Okay, unless they bit their tongue, which is kind of a soft sign that they had a seizure, I might not find anything at autopsy, in which case I would have to rely on the medical history of epilepsy. And that would be class four. Lethal pathology is not structurally demonstrable. I can't see anatomy. I can't see, um, you know, a seizure because a seizure has to do with an electrical storm in the brain. And once a person's dead, the brain's no longer working. <laughs> Okay, so in those cases, I have a dead body, I've done a full autopsy, I haven't found anything, but I have a medical history of something that can kill them, and that would be class four. And then again, rare cases, less than 5% are undetermined, where I have a dead body, I've done full autopsy, full toxicology, full everything, and I can't figure out the cause of death. That does happen sometimes. It's mostly in cases where people are uh, badly decomposed, so the body's starting to fall apart, 
or, you know, skeletonized. <laughs> Here's some bones found at the side of the road, figure out why they died. You know, like, unless I found some trauma to those bones that would be consistent with lethal trauma, like a stab wound to the heart, I, I don't know why they died. Everything's decomposed and, and been eaten away by, you know, maggots and bacteria and possible scavengers, you know, like I, all I have is bones. So I may not be able to figure out the cause of death just from the bones. And that would be class five or undetermined. Yeah. So when this when classification to, system is a way of thinking about how we do our job. Yeah. For, for class five, do mm -hmm. you have to, like, if you had a hypothesis on something or is it like you have yeah. to know for sure? Well, you have to have physical evidence. So okay. the autopsy is physical evidence. And if I don't have evidence, I'm going to say undetermined. Now, that okay. doesn't mean we can't, based on the circumstances, infer <laughs> that something bad happened. You know, so if you have, let's say, an eyewitness who says, I saw this person strangled and dumped at the side of the road and it happened 30 years ago and I didn't say anything. You know, we could still write a death certificate where we could say, uh, strangulation, but we would be not be relying on the physical evidence. We would be relying on their testimony. And that would be a different way of writing a death certificate. Okay. It wouldn't be, it would be based on the historical witness testimony and not based on the anatomic findings because you didn't have any. Yeah. Very cool. So in addition to being forensic pathologists, uh, we have other jobs, uh, that, exist in our realm. And those are that of death investigators. Um, death investigators investigate deaths and they go out to the scene. They bring the body back to the uh, morgue. They speak to the family members and get a general history about what, what, when was the person last seen alive? When were they found dead? What did they find? So that's another potential job for people who, let's say, maybe are not interested in medical school, but want to go into this realm. And, uh, and death investigators um, typically will have uh, maybe a bachelor's degree or a mor mortuary science degree. Degree, but they're comfortable with dead bodies and they get trained on the job to do that. So next slide. Um, so the scene investigation, our investigators will talk to the person who found the deceased. They ask for, you know, why did you look for them? When were they last seen alive? Was the room locked or secured? They would get medical history. They would get a drug or alcohol history. They're actually our eyes and ears. So they're doing the external, <laughs> the, the, what we call the medical history part <laughs> that the medical student usually does. That's being done by our scene investigators. And they'll talk to others at the scene and then they snoop around. They actually have legal authority to be able to look at the scene to try to find evidence to explain the cause of death. So they'll look in other rooms, they'll look behind the door, they'll look in the closet or in the trash. Um, they will look at the bedside table for medicines, they'll look in the medicine cabinet. And then based on the physical evidence that they find at the scene, they will come back and give us information. For example, that the, the medicine cabinet had three types of medications, two of them were heart medicines and one was um, an opioid and that they counted the medicines and the medicines were off. So it indicates that he's not taking his heart medication in too much of the opioids. So that kind of gives us a hint, ah, this might not be a car, you know, this could be a cardiac death or this could be an overdose. And so that death scene investigation gets put in a report that I will get in the morning before I go in to do the autopsy. So next slide. Um, so they evaluate the body at the scene and they're trained to evaluate the position if there's any post-mortem changes. And they're also trained to look for signs of disease or injury. Like for example, that there's a GI bleed, there's bleeding at the scene and it looks like the person was vomiting blood. And then they have to ask themselves, the same thing I ask myself when I'm in the autopsy suite, is, is the condition of the body matching the story that they're being given? So they will also go head to toe at the scene, the investigators, to do that assessment. And part of my job as a forensic pathologist is to train death investigators and to teach them. So I do have a teaching position too, where I teach police officers and uh, death first responders, death scene investigators on how to do their job. So next slide. So one of the things that people always ask me about, this is a very common question, is the time of death. Because if you watch television shows, they always get it down to the, like the half hour or the minute. You know, he died between 9 and 9.30 last night. And they're always so specific, right? Um, the truth is time of death is not that reliable. We still don't have good science behind this. So if any of you who are watching are interested in doing research into this field, it would be very useful. Um, right now, the scene investigation, things like uh, the last mail that was picked up, the last phone messages, when they were last seen alive, that's the most reliable. Um, but we also look for signs on the body. 
We look for rigor mortis, which is the stiffening of the body after death. We, looked for, we look for liver mortis, which is the pooling of blood after death. Uh, we look for cooling of the body, algor mortis, to see how it cools, and we can do an estimate based on body temperature. But that's assuming that everybody started off at normal, <laughs> at 98.6 Fahrenheit, right? And that's also taking into account the ambient temperature, because a body that is 98.6, but is in a hot ambient environment where it's 100 degrees out, it's not going to cool, it's going to actually go up, <laughs> it's going to match the ambient temperature, versus, you know, if it's a really freezing environment. Um, and then we can look at stomach emptying, that takes about four hours, ballpark, but that can help us time it relative to the time they were last seen eating. And you can also even take a uh, fluid from the eyeball, that's the vitreous fluid, the clear fluid in the eye, and measure the potassium at the first point, may maybe at the scene, and then maybe an hour later, and track it. And there's a way of back calculating to try to give an estimate of time of death on that. None of those are very reliable, and they're all dependent on the temperature. So when you watch television shows and they get it down to the half hour, um, it would be highly unusual <laughs> for a forensic pathologist to be that specific. Usually we give a ballpark and then we hedge. We say plus or minus several hours, <laughs> usually, <laughs> which doesn't doesn't help for, for most television shows. Uh, Next slide. Television isn't <laughs> real. That's not true. Yeah, it's make believe. So I wanted to give a photo. I know I, know I didn't want to put too many disturbing photos in here, but this is kind of a, a, an example of live mortis. This person was found face down on a blanket and some sheets, and you can see kind of the wrinkling. And all that purple discoloration on the chest is just the pooling of blood after death. That's not injury. So part of my job is to be able to determine when I see stuff like this, whether it is actual injury or whether it's just what we call post-mortem changes. So next slide. Um, I also have to use proper terminology. So terminology that you would use in my field would be things like abrasions, contusions, and lacerations. So blunt trauma is caused by uh, a broad surface or a hard surface as opposed to a cutting, a sharp surface. Okay, so blunt trauma, the terms we use are abrasions, contusions, and lacerations. Abrasions are scrapes. Contusions or, contusions or bruises that are caused by a blunt injury, and lacerations or tearing of the skin or soft tissue caused by a blunt object. And there are certain characteristics of those injuries that can help us distinguish blunt trauma from sharp trauma. And then, uh, interesting yeah, question, question from one of the students: sure. How how does organ donation and autopsies work? Uh, uh, are are people question. who are or organ donors getting autopsies? Are they uh, obviously needing to do donate organs before they're coming to you, If I guess, if Correct. they're donating? So the majority of organ donors are dying of natural disease. So they wouldn't even come to the coroner medical examiner if there's a known reason why they're dying. For example, uh, they had a heart attack um, from, uh, you know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or they had a stroke from hypertension, and it's known why they are dying, then those cases wouldn't even be referred to the coroner or medical examiner. And in the hospital setting, the doctors would write the death certificate based on the natural disease, and they would be approved for organ donation. So they wouldn't come to autopsy at all. Yep. If a case is sudden, unexpected, or violent and falls under the jurisdiction of the coroner, then people need to have permission from the coroner in order to donate their organs. Because if it's a suspicious case, then the pathologist might say, no, not this one, okay? In the majority of cases though, we do work in concert with organ procurement agencies to try to facilitate organ donation when it's possible. So for example, if somebody's in a motorcycle accident and they suffer devastating head trauma, but all of their other organs are intact, as long as we've got good documentation of all the other organs being okay, they're okay to go to donation. And then our autopsy will primarily obviously focus on the head because that's all that's left. Everything else was <laughs> taken away, okay? But we will examine the other body cavities as well to make sure that there isn't any injury that can explain the death outside of the head injury that was documented in the hospital. So we, we can allow organ donation, those people who are on life support in the hospital, and we can also allow for tissue donation for people who have died, but their organs are not uh, usable because of either injury or time interval. But for example, we can donate their skin or their corneas or their heart valves, and that can even be done after an autopsy in some cases. 
So um, to continue the lecture with regards to blunt trauma, one of the things I'm asked to assess is planar injury. So if a person, for example, falls on a surface, they can have injury to their eyebrow, their nose, and their cheek, and it's all from a single impact versus on the top of the head or the back of the head, each one is an additional impact. And this becomes important in ascertaining whether a person had an accidental fall or whether they were beaten up by somebody. Because generally in an accidental fall scenario, you're going to have only one plane of injury versus if somebody beats them up and then they fall, you're going to have multiple planes of injury. So this is showing how that's um, assessed. And the next slide, this slide shows you the difference between blunt trauma on the right with a hammer, where you have the undermining, you have irregular edges, you have tissue bridging, which is little strip of tissue that hold the um, edges together versus in sharp trauma on the left where the knife is, it's a very, very uh, straight, clean wound. Okay, it might be bloody, but it's clean in the sense of the margins are, 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 are exacting and clean because it's being sliced by a knife. So being able to dif differentiate between sharp trauma and blunt trauma is part of my job as a forensic pathologist. So next slide. Um, so the terminology we use in sharp trauma is different from blunt trauma. Remember, in blunt trauma, we used abrasions, contusions, and lacerations. In sharp trauma, we'll use the term incised wound. An incised wound is like a slash. It's wider than it is deep. And a stab wound is deeper than it is wide. It's when you stab somebody. So we'll, we'll have to classify our wounds differently and use different terminology. And a chop wound is interesting. So it's like a, a machete or a hatchet. Those tend to be like unwieldy or heavy weapons. So they tend to look sharp on the outside where the edges are nice and sharp and clean and well de demarcated. But on the inside of the body, they, they look like blunt trauma. You end up with, you know, crushed bones and lacerated organs. So, so that's a, a in between. And then sometimes we're asked in court or by family members, were there any defensive injuries or the police will ask this. This is an indication, again, that there was an assault or a struggle where a person, you know, puts up their arm or hand to defend themselves against an assailant and there will be injuries on the forearm or on the palm of the hand where they're grabbing at a knife or defending themselves against uh, a knife during a struggle. So that's part of my job is to interpret these kind of injuries as well. Next slide. Now, I also see a lot of gunshot wounds, at least I did in the United States, less so in New Zealand. Um, and we are asked to be able to interpret gunshot wounds, and that includes range of fire, so how far away was the gun from the target, and the direction of fire. What was the trajectory of the bullet in the body? Where did it enter? Where did it exit? And what path did it take? What organs did it hit through the body? And that's part of what an autopsy can answer. So next slide. Um, so we know this, we can figure this out by knowing what comes out of a handgun. So if you look at a handgun, this is a stop motion. You can see the flame in the upper right hand corner uh, that shows that when a target is really close to a gun, it can cause burn marks on the skin versus if you're in an intermediate range, you may not get those burn marks, but you might get the soot or the smoke that deposits on the skin or on the clothing. And then at a, that's a close range is with the smoke. And then in intermediate range, um, you will get unburnt particles of gunpowder that can leave little abrasions, little marks on the skin called stippling. So the next slide is gonna be a little bit disturbing. Okay, so just kind of trigger warning that there's some skin, not this one, the one after that, but that's okay. St let's stick on this one for a second. You can see that when the gun is close to the target, the soot will deposit on the skin or on the clothing versus at intermediate range, the soot goes up in a poof of smoke and only the unburned particles of gunpowder deposit on the skin. So you can, by looking at the wound, figure out how close the gun was to the target. So that I think the next slide is the yucky one. Okay, so here's your warning. Okay, so this is how we de determine by looking at individual wounds, how close the gun was to the target. In a hard contact wound, you can see the picture at the top, um, you will have uh, blowback lacerations where gas has split the skin and the soot is actually in the wound. On a loose contact, if the gun is loosely stuck to the surface of the skin, it'll be a burn mark, which is all black like that. You can see the soot and searing of the skin. It's like burned skin. And then in close range, which is less than six inches for most handguns, you'll have soot that deposits around the wound, which is powdery and black, and it actually can be wiped off. And then at intermediate range, which for most handguns is between six inches and about 30 inches, you see the stippling. They're little black dots like that. And they deposit 
on the skin and they can actually burn the skin or braid the skin. So you get little red dots if the, if the, if the um, unburned particles are wiped away. And then at distant range, when you're outside of about three feet, and that's three feet actually seems kind of close, right? But that's still a distant range wound. You won't have any soot and any stippling. And the wound is just a round punched out hole with, with a margin of abrasion and no soot around it. And that's the picture at the bottom. And then exit wounds look different than entrance wounds. They're lacerated, okay, but they don't have any soot. So you can take those edges and you can reapproximate them and close up the skin. So all of this is information that we use. This is how a pathologist would look at gunshot wounds to figure out which one is the entrance and which one is the exit. So that figures tells me the direction of fire and how close was the gun to the target by looking at the soot and the stippling. Okay. For Next someone slide. like for someone yeah. like me who's uh who's yeah. got a billion freckles, is it hard to see <laughs> stippling when you have lots of freckles? Not so much with freckles, but um, there is a thing called pseudo stippling. So if I were to hypothetically shoot you through uh, a glass window, the glass could shatter and cause little abrasions that look just like stippling. Freckles look different. Freckles are brown. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> they're, they're not red. <laughs> and, um, and if I were to put it under a microscope, I would see the pigmentation too. So that's another way to distinguish a freckle, for instance, from, from a stippling from a gunshot wound. But uh, mostly I can tell by the naked eye. So I don't know if this video will work. Let's see if we can try. If you click on it, it shows you there's a play. Yeah. So this is a video animation showing um, a reconstruction of a gunshot wound incident. This man was seen holding something that looked like a gun in his hand and the um, neighbors called the police and the police came and they staged. And then we've got one officer over here who's holding a handgun and another officer in the far back. We're going to show him in a second who's holding a shotgun. And both of them shot simultaneously because they thought that the man was going to shoot at them. Okay. And so they had multiple intersecting paths. The shotgun shoots pellets. So those are yellow in a, my body diagram. The handgun shoots uh, a bullet, which is red in the body diagram. So you could see there are multiple intersecting paths, both from the shot and from the bullets, from the handgun. And we can use a reconstruction such as this to demonstrate for a jury how the paths through the anatomic diagram that I made at the autopsy make sense for the posture of the person. So it's part of my job to testify in court in these cases so that a jury can then decide whether or not um, the police officers, for instance, were uh, shooting appropriately or not shooting appropriately. Okay, uh, next slide. Oh, we can go here. So let's talk about testifying in court. In addition to performing autopsies and writing reports and talking to families and the police, I will occasionally be called usually about once a month to testify in court. And there's a difference between a fact witness and an expert witness. And for those of you who have been watching uh, Derek Chauvin's trial uh, for the death of George Floyd, you saw a lot of expert witnesses testifying. Uh, the expert witnesses, first of all, have to be qualified. So you have to give your credentials and say what your degree and your training was that allows you to give that testimony. Unlike a fact witness, you can give opinions, okay? A fact witness can only talk about what they saw or what they heard but they can't say, well, I think such and such. <laughs> you see what I mean? My, they can't interpret those as an opinion. That testimony is not allowed, but an expert witness is allowed to give an opinion. So for example, in the Derek Chauvin trial, the testimony that uh, uh, Mr. Floyd died from asphyxia, okay? That is opinion testimony being given by uh, the experts. In that case, it was a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, as well as uh, two forensic pathologists for the prosecution. And then the defense had other experts that testified. And then experts are also allowed to use hearsay. So a fact witness can't tell, can't testify to what other people told them, but an expert witness is exempt from that. And if, for example, we read something in the medical record or the family told us something, we can rely on hearsay if it supports our, our expert opinions. OK, so there's some differences between the rules that pertain to fact witnesses as a, a fact witnesses would be people who witness the crime as opposed to the expert witnesses who would be include the forensic pathologist who did the autopsy. 
Okay. And the most common question I get asked because people love television is why is my job like CSI? And in some ways it is. Um, the ways it is like CSI is number one, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I really love what I do. It, I, I, most forensic shows actually do show the forensic pathologists and the medical examiners uh, being fascinated and excited about what they find. Um, and that is accurate. Uh, it is icky. So you do need to have a you know, sufficiently strong stomach, but not any different from any other doctor. <laughs> I mean, you're going to see blood, you're going to be dealing with, you know, guts, you're going to be dealing with really disturbing, uh, traumatic incidents. So you do have to desensitize yourself with your training in order to be able to tolerate that. It is scientific. Uh, we are using science <laughs> and it is dramatic. We are dealing with uh, people in very difficult parts of their lives. And, you know, the, the worst thing in their life has just happened to them. So not the decedents, like I said, the family members, but we're there to give them answers and to give them closure. And so that part can be really emotionally difficult. Um, so that's where it is like CSI. It's also not like CSI in certain other ways. So the next slide <laughs> is where the differences yeah. are. There have been a couple questions about mental health. Oh, and you, you just brought it up. Yeah. What, what's the what have you found works for you um, to, mm -hmm. to separate yourself from what you're seeing day in and day out? Um, the first thing that you need to know is that the training program for to go into forensic pathology or to go to any medical specialty. I mean, all medicine, right? We have processes in place in order to teach medical students how to cope. <laughs> okay, we don't just throw people in and go here, be a doctor now, <laughs> all right? All of medical school, all of your residency, you learn coping techniques. You learn it from your colleagues, you learn it from lectures, um, you get support either uh, through therapy or through, um, you know, group sessions where you talk amongst each other um, and you support each other. So that that is a really important and, and not not enough discussed part of medical training is that we support each other. And then for me personally, I find that writing things down really helps me. So um, TJ, my husband and I, uh, TJ Mitchell is uh, an author and he, he was the English major <laughs> and I'm the science person. And together we write books. So Working Stiff is a book based on my training at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office. But we've also written two novels, Aftershock and First Cut. And those novels are a way for me to kind of synthesize or process what I deal with on a daily basis. So when I have a particularly interesting case or an emotionally stressful case, by writing down about it, even in a fictional way, it helps me with the processing. It's my way, it's my therapy, so to speak. Um, but obviously I have other mechanisms of support, exercise, you know, reaching out to my colleagues, uh, email list, Facebook groups, social media are ways that we connect and support each other. Yeah. And then for anybody who's interested in the field and wants to know more, um, I mentioned Working Stiff. That's about the fellowship training program uh, that's available at all major booksellers. It's also on Kindle and uh, you know Amazon, whatever. They all have their electronic versions of it. And then there's First Cut and Aftershocks, which are novels, but they're based on actual cases uh, or you know, amalgams of cases, which I fictionalized for the detective series. So for those of you who like detective novels, kind of like Patricia Cornwell or Kathy Rikes, it's in that kind of genre where the detective is a forensic pathologist. And then I'm also on Facebook and on Twitter, both myself and TJ, my husband um, and co-author. And uh, I'm at both Facebook and on Twitter and also on Instagram. Usually Facebook and Twitter is where I share information about uh, you know teaching opportunities, uh, lectures that are online, uh, interesting books in the in the field, um, uh, what's going on in the news that pertains to forensic pathology. So if you're interested in that, you can follow us on social media. And then I have two links up there that I'm hoping that you could share at your site. One is for a blog post that I wrote about how to become a forensic pathologist, like steps, <laughs> really well drawn out steps. Like if you're a medical student, this is what you should do. If you're an undergraduate, this is what you should do. Uh, if you're in high school, <laughs> this is what you should do. So it's like step-by-step -step instructions on how to become a forensic pathologist is for my blog post. And there's also information at the link for NAME, the National Association of Medical Examiners. So they have a website called thename.org, T-H-E-N-A-M-E.org. And the second link is a document that they have on their website about how to become a forensic pathologist as well. So that, that would be useful information for students. Awesome. Thank you so much. If you want to come ask a question, go ahead and raise yeah. your hand. I'll bring you up. Let me stop sharing the screen for now. 
Um, some good discussion going on in the chat. Oh, good. This is bring, exciting. Um, <laughs> Love this. Have, I think we, we were close to a thousand. We're down to nine seventeen, nine fifteen wow. now. Um, so hopefully lots of That's forensic great. pathologists in the making. To be yes. yes. So <laughs> Shane joining the room. He's been with us uh every week almost. How are you doing, Shane? <laughs> Hi. I'm doing pretty oh, good. Oh, I'm I'm to see him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier that uh kind of finding the time of death is an area of research that's pretty common. Um, so I got kind of curious, like what does research like logistically look like in a pathology setting? Like, cause obviously you're getting the bodies after the fact, it's not really, uh, you know, possible to draw a direct cause and effect. Like how do you complete research uh, to be applied in pathology? That's a good question. So in order for us to do research in most cases, you need some sort of, um, uh, institutional board approval. So you need to have uh, a project in mind and you need to get approval through uh, an AP, usually academic institution to make sure that the research that you're doing is, is appropriate and it's not um, taking advantage of people, that there's proper consent. Um, in some cases, you can do what's called retrospective research where you go back <laughs> and look at things. So you don't necessarily need prospective consent from the decedents or from their families, but you can look back at the records or you can look back at the um, uh, documents that you've collected, for example, by performing lots of different autopsies. Um, so there's all different types of opportunities for research in the realm of forensic pathology. Uh, they tend to be in academic institutions as opposed to in examiner's offices um, through often forensic uh, programs like PhD programs or master's programs. But I've worked on research even in my field as a pathologist. In many cases, we need consent from the coroner at the very least mm -hmm. to be able to do the work. So for example, you know, we were talking about post-mortem changes. One of the ways that you could study that would be looking at actual cases that have come in where we actually know the time of death because it was documented, it was witnessed. <laughs> and right. then we have the we have an accurate post-mortem interval. And then we can measure whatever it is that we're looking to measure to see if it has changed or changed in a predictive type of way that's that can be used prospectively to apply to cases where we don't know the post-mortem interval. So that would be an example of doing research in specifically time of death. But I've done research on all sorts of different aspects in forensics, including, um, you know, uh, people who have had gastric bypass. <laughs> what do they die of? So, I, you know, those are case reports where I will have, you know, six or eight cases who all died after gastric bypass. And we document those findings and then share it with the medical community so that the surgeons who are doing <laughs> those surgeries know what to look out for when they have a patient who's not doing well. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Thanks so much. Jane. Olivia, hello. Unmute yourself. Yes. Hello. I am Hi. so happy to be here. I watched your real CSF here on YouTube. And oh, great. Um, <laughs> I teach at a forensic science. So some of this. Some yes. Yeah. So some of this was a repeat for you then. Uh, a little bit, but there was a lot of information that was new. And Good. I was specifically interested in the death investigations if you actually go to crime scenes. And I did not know that you also trained death investigators. So I was wondering if yeah. you could talk more about that. Sure. So part of the fellowship training, and even in, in my residency, when I was in my pathology residency, I did a rotation at the medical examiner's office, and we do ride-alongs with the death investigators to learn what the death investigation entails. So they train us, and then we subsequently grow up <laughs> and mature and learn more and train them. So I was trained by death and by professional death investigators and police where we went to scenes. And um, in Working Stiff, I describe some of the ride-alongs and what they're like. So the, the training process for a forensic pathologist does involve going to scenes and learning how to assess a scene like you're a death investigator. So that way, when and if you move on to another office, you can train your own new death investigators and make sure that the death investigations that you're getting 
are are sufficient and can answer the questions that you need. So so that is part of the training process, both in residency and in especially in fellowship. But then subsequently, depending on the office of where you work, you may or may not get called out to scenes. So when I was at the San Francisco Medical Examiner's Office, I got called out to scenes pretty regularly, at least once a month. And uh, then I switched and worked in Alameda County, which is a sheriff coroner's office. And they relied on us much more infrequently or much less frequently. Um, I would probably go out to a scene once a year at Alameda County. Mm -hmm. But part of that is because I was a contractor and I wasn't in, in charge of the office. I wasn't the chief. And in that particular office, the chief would get called because they were a salaried employee and they didn't have to pay them to go out to the scene versus the contractors would get paid per hour or per scene. And so there was a cost benefit analysis going on about whether or not they would uh, ask someone to go out to the scene. I, I find that going to the scene is incredibly important and incredibly useful, not only in the training process, but in also educating yourself and making sure you're up to date and interpreting things properly. Thank Thanks, you. Also, oh, could I ask one more question? No, I got to move on to the other two people. Sorry. You can put it in the, put it in the things. <laughs> put it in the questions Twitter. afterwards. You know how to read me. <laughs> Mary, hello. Hi. Um, so I'm actually an undergrad student who's currently majoring in forensic anthropology. Luckily, we have the body farm here. So I've gotten some great like hands on experience and I was planning on taking a gap year. So is there anything you would give to advise like what I could do during my gap year? So where are you located? You're in Tennessee? Yes, ma'am. The University of Tennessee. <laughs> That's right. So I know some of your instructors <laughs> um, for gap year. Let's see. You want to do a gap year between this and um, and medical school? Is that the plan? Yes, ma'am. Um, I would actually reach out to your um, pr principal investigators at the body farm where you are right now. Talk to the um, to the PhDs. Talk to um, Amy. <laughs> Zelson, Dr. Zelson. I had her for forensics, my forensics class. <laughs> Go to her, tell her that Judy sent you <laughs> and tell her that you're taking a gap year and you'd like to do research in forensic anthropology or tag along or do anything to see what you can do to learn more during that year. Um, and she will give you advice or refer you to the right people. <laughs> so that's who you should talk to. Talk to Amy. Um, she was the um, anthropologist in New York when I was there at the New York City Medical Examiner. I was office. curious. She's, actually, because, she's yeah. actually in working staff. So I mentioned her in working staff and some of her <laughs> investigations and what I learned, I learned from her at the time. And she didn't even have a PhD at the time. She was still a master. So she just had her master's and she was amazing. So she would be a wonderful source of information as will the other staff at the body farm that can give you advice about opportunities in forensic anthropology mm -hmm. that will help define that year. Um, the other thing you can do is you can also volunteer or look for positions in pathology departments um, at hospitals. So that's what I, the, my pathology post-sophomore fellowship was kind of born out of the fact that I had been doing research with some pathologists. You know, you can go on to any, if you've got a medical school that you want to go to, Mm -hmm. OK, you can actually go online at their website and research who's in the pathology department and what research they're doing and then read up on their research and hit them up for, you know, volunteer opportunities or research opportunities in their labs. You've got your bachelor's degree, so they might actually pay you for this. <laughs> you know, that would be nice if it was paid as opposed to just an unpaid internship. Right. But given that you've got a skill set, you know how to do science, you have a degree, you have some laboratory experience from the classes that you've taken as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. So you could put together a nice little resume for them and say, hey, I'd like to work in your lab for a year. Do you have a grant that I can work on? Do you have some opportunities where I to be paid for my work for the year? Um, and that would be another, another thing that you can do during that gap year that will not only interest you, but can open doors for you in terms of getting into medical school or uh, pursuing your career after medical school. Great. Nice. Thank you so much. All right, Mary. Mary, you got to come back on to eShadowing in, in a couple of weeks and let us know how that yeah. interaction went with, uh, with Amy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Networking 101. Amy, the, speaking Thank of you. Amy. Speaking of Amy. <laughs> I, I just had a question. Do you know of any um, new possible specialties or areas of interest in forensic pathology, like more specialized areas? 
Yeah. So there are sub sub specialties of forensic pathology. So you can do pathology, then you do forensic pathology. And then there are sub specialties, including forensic neuropathology, where you're studying the brain and the spinal cord of people who have died by traumatic injuries. Um, there is a realm of uh, there are actually forensic sub specialties, not of pathology. For instance, if you let's say go into OBGYN, and you're comfortable doing uh, sexual examinations of women's bodies, then there is there's uh, forensic nursing where you can do uh, genital exams and uh, post rape exams in, in victims of sexual assault. And they can come from the nursing profession as well as from the medical profession. You can I've seen I've seen both doctors and nurses do those kind of exams. Um, there are uh, there's forensic uh, nursing separate from the sexual assault exams where any time uh, somebody has died as a result of, let's say, malpractice from the nursing angle. For example, they died in a, in a, um, a long-term care facility where the nursing practice was not uh, sufficient or up to par. Then there are nurses that will review those medical charts and give advice and testimony in court as nurses <laughs> about forensic examinations. Um, there are so many different subspecialties, even within forensic pathology. Besides neuropathology, we also have forensic cardiovascular pathology because a lot of our deaths are sudden in the that involve the uh, the heart. Uh, there are molecular pathology specialties that have to do with looking at the genetic analysis of people who die suddenly um, of diseases such as um, long QT syndrome or uh, collagen vascular disorders, things like that. So there are, there are definitely subspecialties that can inform us or support us in our work as forensic pathologists. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Dr. Judy Melanick author of some amazing books like working stiff i love that one what are the names of your novels again i haven't checked oh those the first one yet. is it's yeah you should they're fun because i try to make them real like they're based yeah. on actual cases that i've investigated we've just fictionalized the construct <laughs> the, the plot is fiction but it's yeah. the actual science is in there and i try to make it accurate so it portrays what a forensic pathologist would actually be doing um, awesome. the type of work that they would be doing so the first one is called first cut and then the second one is aftershock and the main detective her name is jesse tesca she is a young forensic pathologist in san francisco loosely based on <laughs> me <laughs> and my experience at the san francisco <laughs> medical examiner's office did you get I was there for nine years through your writing of her? You're like, yes. I wish I would have done this Very when much. I was growing up. <laughs> well, don't, don't say that to my husband because, you know, she's she's not married and she's having you know, <laughs> affairs with different people. So there's like, okay. you know, See, because it's a genre it's <laughs> <laughs> we No, I mean, he writes them. Yeah. <laughs> he, he knows. <laughs> it's just that it's not that part is not based on me. That's funny. <laughs> Well, hopefully the world opens up again and I, I see you and TJ at another conference yes. and we can, we can all say hello. Thank you for in spending person. your and lunch hug. hour. Yes, real, real hugs <laughs> these days. Oh, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. And yeah. uh, man, I, I need to make it to New Zealand. I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> but uh, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. 